Welcome to Three Devs and a Maybe, the podcast series for beginner web developers and general web enthusiasts. Now, introducing your show hosts Michael Budd, Fraser Hart, Lewis Gaines, and Ed Mann. Hello and welcome to another episode of Three Devs and a Maybe. My name's Ed Mann, and it's a very special episode today. It's an in person episode. Which is, I think we've only had three of those in the lifetime of the podcast. Um, I'm very lucky to be joined by William Thomas. Hello there. Hello, Will. Well, for, for the audience, uh, Will is my great designer friend. Uh, he, he's a colleague. I work with My Builder. Um, we're actually in the My Builder meeting room at the moment. You're sipping on a nice beverage. I am. You know, a, what is it? A Lagan- 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 daytime ale. Very nice. They go pretty quick in this office though, don't they? They do. Yeah. You, a peach. Re- they, they are a peach. Ages ago, we've been speaking about trying to do this. We did, so um, keep you know, putting it off. Well, this is, <laughs> well, it's, I mean, it's trying to work out times, and then it's also really like, because I know we were thinking about doing it through Skype, but actually it's quite nice doing it in person. Um, so it's really nice, yeah, to have, finally have you here. We can talk design and stuff, because, I mean, exciting times in my builder office and design-wise, you know, and everything. And, Absolutely, yeah. But for your person, like, I mean, I always like starting off this question, like, how did you get into design? So, so what drew you to it, really? Uh, so at school, I always liked drawing and doodling and stuff like that, and invariably that sort of translated into various hobbies. Um, early on, sort of as a teenager, I was doing lots of album covers for friends' bands and my own band, lots of promotional material like that and posters and stuff. Um, and I found this bit of software for Windows, I'm trying to think, XP probably, um, called the Games Factory, which is a bit of a sort of click, drag and drop software right, for making yeah. your own video games. And I got really into that. And that required me to make my own assets as pixel assets. And I just spent thinking back. <laughs> Stupid it's, hours. It's absolutely <laughs> staggering how much free time that the kids have. And the amount of hours I invested making games. It's just mind boggling. Did, were they, did you finish these games or was it like you go on to one? Like, cause I know when I was a kid, like the attention span of any, like peanut, you just go from one to another. You never finish. Yeah. I would seldom finish a game, but the amount that I would get done was quite surprising. Um, and there was just so much time went into that, like making the sprites and, and even recording my voice to do sound effects. Oh, wow. That yeah. is really intense. Cool. Um, I would find MIDI versions of... I was really into new metal, you know, mm. like bands like Korn. So I'd find MIDI versions of these songs because you could only use MIDI. Uh, <laughs> and, like, all of my games had, like, Brilliant. these bootleg soundtracks and, like, free collaboration uh. stuff. I essentially made Super Mario, but in a cave with a gun shooting aliens. It's like a proper hardcore Super Mario with then, like, Korn playing in a MIDI format in yeah, the background. exactly. It was very grunge. Um, have you actually got screenshots of any like material from these? Yeah, I, I am actually, really. I need to put these in the show notes because that sounds interesting. I pulled all the assets. Uh, I found them all and I cut them all out and, and saved them as PNGs because they were like this sort of um, in-engine format. I have no idea what it was, but I've actually a few years ago I tried rebuilding the game from scratch using the original assets uh, in Impact JS. Oh wow! Cool. And I got so far. I mean, I I didn't get a heck of a lot done. Um, just jumping and moving around platforms and things. And, uh, Impact JS has got so many great features in there. Um, it actually made it slightly better in some respects. I had parallax scrolling in there and so maybe I'll, I'll pick it up one day. I think you it. definitely <laughs> need to, right? The world needs like a new metal kind of hardcore Super Mario. I never got around to working the sound into the Impact JS. Oh, version. that would be great. Yeah, um, and my brother he did it a lot as well, and we'd work. So did you t- like do it together, or were you kind of competing, kind of? We brotherly? kind of uh, yeah, we had like our, our own studios, if you yes. like, and we'd have collaborations, and we we made a snowboarding game together. It was quite interesting. That's cool. Um, and he made a game for his college uh, final piece for his dissertation piece, and it was quite interesting. Cause was this he, in the same software that you were using? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and he, he did all of the art, all of the graphics in watercolors and scanned them in and put them into the game. So it was like an art piece. It was hell. art college. Um, except for the, the actual characters, the animated characters, because that would be really hard. Um, and he wasn't that great at animating. So I remember at the time, I was four years younger than him. So I guess I would have been what, like 14 or something. Mm. Um, and he had a horse in the game and it, he couldn't animate it. So he paid me in pancakes to animate the horse. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's very, so was this plain pancakes or did you get flat, you know, what toppings on there? Were these, they? were, these were crepes. It was up to me to put the toppings on. All right. Well, you know, that's good. That's brilliant. That's yeah. awesome. And so from there then, like, did you get into the Photoshop stuff? Like, was that with Photoshop and things like that? Or were you just using other, like, different software? Yeah, like, I, I was using Photoshop uh, loads just for album artwork and stuff like that. And, How did you and learn that then? Like, did you, was it YouTube videos, tutorials, or did you just kind of pick it up? My brother got a cracked copy and it was just a case of trial and error. Yeah. It was never tutorials. I don't think YouTube was... A thing, a yeah, thing. I suppose 2005, yeah. <laughs> well, we're really dating ourselves here, there you go. Yeah. yeah, so you just had to, and again, I think that's just testament to how much, not only free time, but... Uh, perseverance. Dedi- perseverance like and dedication. Yeah. I think kids don't get enough credit these days. You yeah. think, oh, kids, they don't have any attention span. But back then, I mean, I, we all put in so much work into, like, those little projects. Um, well, whether you- it was, like, Photoshop or band stuff, like, we had endless enthusiasm for these things. And, I mean, that's it, and it's the hardest part-time, because you're not only, you're learning it, which is the most, firstly, it's the most, you know, I mean, it takes the most energy to learn something new. You know, once you learn it, obviously, you know it, you know, and stuff, but you're having to learn these things, you're then having to apply, you probably then find out it doesn't work. You know, as a kid, you've got to say this enthusiasm, you need to have this as constant drive to want to keep doing it and changing it and... And it's great. I mean, that, that's a really cool thing. Like, to, and I mean, for, how long were the? So do, you, do you still? Obviously, you're still in a band, but do yeah. you still do the promotion material and stuff like that? Or not kind of, so much now, I guess, because it's my job. <laughs> I, I think. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> I think that, that's a tough thing. Like, I think I have as much enthusiasm as I did back then, but after work and you get home around seven, you just don't have the energy yeah. to do it. So, as much as I would love to do lots of personal projects, I can't get as much done as I as I used to obviously but um, I still try and do things obviously I do band stuff um, I'm getting married in July so I've been doing loads of like invitation stuff very good invitations I can say audience very good thank you I, I don't um, want to know how many hours went into that or I know that, I remember having conversations with you and you were just saying like how many you know you were spending a lot of time uh, it was it was a lot of fun because <laughs> it was a print project and I got a chance to do loads of stuff I would never normally do. So and it's for yourself, which is probably the worst client in the world. I yeah, imagine. I mean, when you don't have those constraints, you can go mad thinking of of what they should be. But it was nice because I explored with materials mm. and different envelopes. Like it's got a sort of string washer envelope, which is nice. And I got some rubber stamps made, and these are all sorts of things. You should I'd... blog about it. I don't know how, why you haven't put a blog out. Yeah, on... I've, I've put some stuff on Dribble. Um, ah, I have to put, I'll put that in the show notes as well. All these yeah, things. I should. I probably should write about it. Uh, but it was just nice because you're working sort of outside of pixels. Mm, that's it. Yeah, and you've got these different medium, haven't you? As you say, you've got this idea of a letter and all the bits that need to be in there. You've got your constraints. You've got the ideas of what you need to have, and you can work play with that. Yeah, and that was that was a big sort of driving factor of it was to try and do something I wouldn't normally do. Um, and ironically enough, the website is actually the worst part of it. I basically just <laughs> dumped a photo of me and Sophie on there, and then just embedded like a naked male chimp. Uh, <laughs> sign up form and that's it and I can just imagine all of my relatives and Thank Sophie's you. relatives is this what he does for a living yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> guys it's better at work you know <laughs> So, I mean, for, so from uh, these games, like you, you did a lot of games. You, I mean, I'm sure you played a lot of games as well. Oh, yeah, start yeah, with yeah. that, um, and you got a lot of inspiration there. Like, what did you go into then? A formal education? Did you go into like college and things like that with in design, or did you kind of just go straight into like the web game? Well, what it was is after school, I couldn't really figure out what I wanted to do. My brother went um, from sixth form to this college called Henley College. And I guess when you're a younger sibling, you usually follow in the footsteps of your older siblings. Well, I mean, obviously, as you both were in the same... I mean, were you both very much in the same thing? You enjoyed design together. You both obviously helped each other. You were learning new techniques together and things like that. Yeah, I suppose so. Um, I don't think my brother has ever had quite as much patience as, as I have. Like, uh, an example is when we were kids and we had Lego sets. Like, my brother would get my dad to build his... For him. It's got to get done. It's got to be done. Where I was, <laughs> where I was always uh, very insistent that I do it myself. Um, so he's gone into business now, and he's like a ludicrously charismatic salesman. He works for Twitch, um, which has its perks, loads of free swag and stuff like that. Which you brought into the office, where it's like I knew it was funny. We come in on a Monday, and you just see you just swagged out in this Twitch gear. Exactly, like, yeah. What have you been up to this weekend? <laughs> well, you know. Um, but yeah, I didn't know what I wanted to do after school. So I went to Henley College and I did the same, um, foundation year that my brother did, which was, um, it was an art foundation, but it spanned everything from, say, 
uh, like filmmaking to fashion to fine art to sculpture. It wow. really touched on yeah, a lot of areas for, for one year. And I figured, because I didn't know what I wanted mm. to do, that would be a great chance to just try a little bit of everything. And then from there, my tutor uh, suggested that I go do this course at uh, Nottingham Trent called Multimedia. And I gather she got a sense that I like doing things with computers and I still wasn't sure what I wanted to yeah. do exactly. And this, again, was just sort of narrowing that funnel. Uh, and that course uh, at Trent was essentially 3D film and web, which I'd never really done before. But, uh, so had you done any web stuff for, like, the music and things like that? No, like, never. Like, apart from, like, MySpace or something like that. Oh, customizing MySpace. Well, I, di- I didn't even do that much, really, oh, apart right. from dropping in images and things. Um, but I lived with loads of computer scientists at university, and they were all doing bits of web stuff. Um, initially the web component of that course was Flash, which I didn't get on with. Um, but eventually we touched on HTML and I, I just really loved it. I liked the idea that all you needed was a text editor. I liked the idea that potentially anyone could see what you were putting out there. Um, and I was making some profoundly dreadful websites. Um, I founded, co-founded the gaming society at my university and I started making loads of websites and things for that. Uh, and then it all grew from there, really. The, the course, so the year that you did, the foundation year where you touched on a lot of different things, like was there anything, you say at the end of the year, did you have an idea that web was it, or was it really the two to them that kind of said that you should kind of consider this? Or? No, I mean, web didn't come into it until I got to university, really. So 2008 probably wow. was when I really started to And what did you like, begin. what did you prefer? Did you have anything you preferred before that? Like, were you kind of more into the print stuff or well, fashion? Growing up, or I always... Well, liked the idea of, of graphic design um, and architecture and product design. Um, but I there weren't really many opportunities mm. to yeah. do hands-on experience, those sorts of things. Um, so I liked design and technology at school, but I wasn't particularly good at like, making things out of wood. So, yeah. <laughs> so this was a nice chance to sort of uh, create stuff digitally, I suppose, which I had a lot of experience with. So then when you went to uni and you, you, you did this and like the web stuff, like, as you say, progressing and everything, like, with the, like, what, was it just HTML then obviously with the CSS and stuff and you said you didn't like macromedia, you didn't like the, you know, the flash and things like that. Did JavaScript come to, into it then? Like That was much, much later. Yeah. So, um, so I, was it very much just like you had Photoshop, then you would, you'd just slice it out, slice and dice it, put it into HTML, CSS, or were you very much... I love the I, the concept of you know the web as a platform, mm. or was it really changing? Like thinking of more like what like, I mean, typically like you have lots of design agencies that still to this day think print medium just change it for the web a little bit and then they can get it sliced and diced and put it on the web. Sure. Or was it? Um, well, I always just liked playing with markup and CSS mm. like as its own medium, if you like. So um, for years, I just was happy to play in that medium. Um, I did a bit of PHP and SQL um, at university, but it was mostly just experimenting with HTML and CSS and seeing how far I could push that. I really enjoyed that. And then it wasn't until my graduating year, where before I even got my uh, diploma, I was working for a company called videogamer.com, and they just needed someone to help them with their front end, uh, just markup. And then... There were some really big projects, and I kind of learned JavaScript through necessity, and that's how I got into that, um, just playing jQuery to begin but with. That's really interesting, though. Like, So really, you did come from it through it, you know, without the whole, you know, the designer agency kind of, you know, I'm going to do it in Photoshop and then going to bring it to the web. I, you wanted to plan the web. The web was your playground, essentially. Yeah, I mean, when I started and... out, I was sort of building in the browser. That's very amazing. trendy now. Yeah. But probably but not that, so much in That's browser. it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's an interesting because, I mean, I suppose, like, with all these projects, what would you do then? Would it be the, the, the new hit trendy thing now, which is I would just code in the browser? Or would you go into Photoshop or Sketch or whatever you know you use no, at that time? No, it is until much later that I started working in in Photoshop and Sketch. So it was kind of weird, sort of returning to Photoshop yeah. for a different use, and then eventually Sketch. Um, 
Whereas now, in the last couple of years, sketch is, is integral to my design process. Well, that's, I, I yeah, imagine it's crazy because I, I never knew that. I, I would assume that you would have done, you know, like going into the, you know, obviously the browser would have come later, the design would have come first. And I think that maybe is, you know, obviously a very good skill and a pro and, a, you know, that you have. Well, yeah, it definitely helps me out now. Yeah. I think also back then when you're younger, you're, you're less patient and you're like, oh, why should I? you know, waste my time. Well, this is it, exactly. Why am I doing this step just so I have to then go and do it, again, you know, in the browser? Why exactly. can't I just have it in yeah. the browser? And, and that's before you have all of your processes uh, figured out and you just want to get straight to it. But um, Sketch is very much an integral part of my process. Now. Mm. And I, I mean, with like the designing kind of stuff, um, was it, what, what browsers would you, would you typically like, I mean, how would you kind of play around with it? Would it be just the text editor? Would you guys like, you know, Chrome, I mean, I don't know what the time, probably like Firebug or something like that, and play around in there, tweak it there and stuff, or was it just the REPL of like, type it in text editor, refresh the page, see it change? Uh, both, I suppose. Um, I remember back then I was using TextMate. Oh, yes, so that was the Mac thing, wasn't it? TextMate was beautiful. It was good, yeah. I guess I was lucky that I did live with a load of, um, you know, computer mm. engineers. Um, so that was really useful, and they had tons of re- resources and loads of time for me to help me figure out all of these things and, and help me set up servers and the like. So that was definitely a massive advantage. And then with learning that, was that, again, similar to how you'd done with, like, the Photoshop, where it was trial and error? Or was yeah, it a absolutely. lot of research, resources online or anything like that? Well, Stack Overflow was yep. immense. <laughs> I don't think anyone could do their job without Stack Overflow. But... Um, when I was at university, the first year was just a taster of doing everything, and then the next two years would be spent either doing the, the film, uh, 3D, or web. Um, and the summer, between the first and the second year, I just lived on Stack Overflow and web schools, which I don't use now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it gets such a bad rap, doesn't it, you know? But everyone in their, in their lifetime has used it at least once. Yeah, and I, I can't remember what it was now. I found this website that taught you HTML. Um, and I, yeah, I was voracious just reading all of this stuff. And then it's kind of weird when I came back and I'd learned all of this stuff and I'd been doing it for months over the summer. And then obviously the first lesson back in the second year was just you know, starting to cover all the stuff that I had and learned. And you kind of feel like, wow, I've really progressed. Like, it's great to kind of be able to say, well, actually, you know, I already know this. I can progress and kind of... Yeah, so more. I ended up being like teacher's assistant in that year. Which, which is how it's the best thing to know. Like, being a teacher, if you have to teach it to someone, that's, you call BS on it, you know, like, they know. Like, once you have to teach it, that's when you actually know something. You yeah. Know? Like, you really do. But I felt like it, it was quite challenging because... A lot of the people doing that course were probably in a similar position than me in that they weren't entirely sure what they wanted yeah. to do. And I've always been quite technically minded, like making games, and uh, I enjoyed science and stuff at school. But I think a lot of the people who were on the course, they really didn't enjoy that aspect of it. And they liked Flash and playing around with that stuff and tweening and whatever. Uh, but when it came to PHP, people really didn't. I think there was like three people in the whole class that actually cared about PHP. Really? They yeah. completely just turned off to it? Yeah. And were those the it. people who would then just go back to like, say like Flash or go to a platform like Photoshop and just live in that world as opposed to kind of delving into... Yeah. I mean, did they enjoy like the CSSs and HTML and stuff like that or was it... I don't... I don't... I don't know. I don't think they had that much time for it. Yeah. I think they preferred... But why is that? I mean, it's interesting because as you say, like, part of the value of being able to do that stuff is you get to see it immediately. You get that result. You don't, you know, I mean, yeah, you see very, it on paper. Very enjoyable. Yeah. Like immediate uh, feedback, as you say. But I guess um, they, they didn't think that's what they were signing up for. Mm. You know, they just wanted to... I don't know. I mean, do you feel it, like, doing that university, like, going through university, going through the foundation, it was very much a good value. Obviously, I mean, it must have been, like, for direction. But, like, the material that they were giving you and stuff, was it enough to, like, I suppose, you know, a lot of it, you know, now is that, you know, especially in, like, in development and in the computer circle is that, you know, you learn enough at university, you know, you learn some fundamentals. I mean, I'm sure you learn a lot of fundamentals of HTML and fundamentals of CSS and things like that. But kind of... Does it prepare you for the real world of design? Not at all. <laughs> and I, that's <laughs> I, exactly I, it's the same I, thing I in the development. Mixed feelings about university. I think it did a great job in preparing me for independent living and, yeah. and being a well-rounded individual, or arguably. Um, <laughs> but it didn't really do anything in terms of, of, of 
preparing me for the work environment. I mean, obviously, as you say, it pointed me in the right direction, and that's how I figured out what I wanted to do and, and what I love doing. But um, like I said, before I even started that module, I knew most of the stuff. I mean, out what, of your own, because that was out of your own time. You knew you wanted to. So really, maybe the main influence was the people you were living with. You know, that's yeah, probably definitely. were. You know, that's true. A driving force. Um, but if you do want to learn how to code, or you want to learn markup or CSS, I mean, the internet is the best place. That's exactly to do it. it. So, um, yeah, as Stack Overflow and all of these resources are absolutely invaluable. And I think all the best programmers I've ever met have always been self-taught. They've always been bedroom coders, and people who have seek out that knowledge themselves. So I can't really credit university with with any of that apart from, as you say, direction. I think, yeah, I, I, I completely concur with that. Like, that's how I'm, I feel, is that it was direction. It was a platform. It was it was those three years of platform of time to be able to spend learning my own stuff, you know, like getting what they give you, but then exploring other things and being able to kind of use what they taught you as a springboard to like, I want to know this now, mm. and now I want to know that, you know, as, a, as opposed to it being like, once I understand all this, because, I mean, this is just you know, the design. I mean, it's such a... With the web and also then with client work and with that, like, university, did they go through things like that? Were they very very much like, oh, yeah, you know, we're going to have, like, a client. Was it, like, client, you know, almost like specking out a real project where it'd be, okay, a client said we need this, here's your limitations, go design it, go build it. Or was it not like that? Like, they wouldn't teach you those kind of fundamentals of project work, I suppose. Well, that was, that was part of it. I think one of the, the final projects we had was real client work. So we had to go oh, find wow. a small business yes. and make them a website. Um, but as you can imagine, you're not going to be working on any kind of system or user interface or anything that you can really sink your teeth into. It's very Because much, it's very much very yeah, high level. This just is, a you know, yeah. Brochure website. Yeah. Exactly. So there weren't really many design challenges there um, other than pleasing the client. You know, like, oh, I like this color over that color or. <laughs> make the logo bigger, etc. you know, a million cliches. Um, so that wasn't immensely challenging. But I think that does prepare you in managing client expectations, yes. and particularly when you're doing agency work or freelance work. 50% of the job is managing client expectations. So I guess I got something out of that. Because that's what I was going to ask you, is like how you do it yourself. And I think as being like self-taught and things like that, you have your own expectation of like a piece of work. So, you know, your design is saying, oh, it could be better. It could be better. It could be better. Clients going to come up and say something completely different. Mm. aren't they? They're, they're going to maybe say, well, no, actually I prefer it like this. And as you say, like that skill there is a, a valuable one to have, to be able to kind of maybe be able to sway them in another direction. Maybe how, you know, I mean, how have you learned that? Has that been on the job learning there? Like, have you kind of picked it up in other areas or was it just kind of, you got into a job and had to learn how to deal with clients and how to deal with their expectations? Yeah. I mean, you absolutely have to learn how to do that. And it just comes with experience. Mm -hmm. I worked in an agency for, for two years. And if you can't work well with your client and you can't manage their expectations, then you're going to have a bad time. Yeah. Um, Clients will very often get an idea of exactly what they want as soon as they have the idea to commission the project. So part of that is is managing those expectations and and making them comfortable with the idea that what they're going to get is different to what they have. In their Which head. is very hard for them because they're thinking they're by like essentially you're just their tool for making what they want. They can picture in their head what they want already before they've even talked spoke to you. I'm guessing. Yeah, in some I cases. mean, there's that famous comic where uh, this, the client is holding. <laughs> like a, a small designer, like a pencil, and they're just rubbing their <laughs> head into a page. Um, and very often they'll have a, they'll have a very spe- specific idea in terms of how to solve the solution in terms of what the deliverables are. And when I was doing agency work, we had clients suggest things like, oh, we want uh, to do data collection at a convention and we want to create a completely custom app for the iPad that we're going to take right. around. And we're like, well, why don't you just use some survey app or something yeah. that already exists? Yeah, there's a problem. This is the solution to that problem. The solution that exists, yeah. yeah. And you can just brand up like some other white label thing and you, you can save clients an absolute mm. fortune. But They had it in their mind already that this was the solution they wanted to go for as opposed to going with you. Exactly. Mm. And you just have to sell them on on why that doesn't make sense. And, and often what it is is rather than them telling you what the solution is, you, you go back to them and say, well, actually, what's the problem? Yeah. And then you, and then you can go with... Exactly. And you need them to believe that that's the right way to go and you need to sell it to them and hold their hand and make sure that they're comfortable with that as well. 
Uh, and that can be really tricky, and that does. But just how, come I mean, with how do you design like? Uh, I mean, how do you sorry uh, like juggle like the design is very passionate. Is you know obviously you're putting you know you're designing something that you care about. You you want to care about this thing, as opposed to then the client coming. You know like how do you kind of deal with their critiquing and like it becomes a business. You know from the passion that it is that you have for design and for making something to the business of all right, we're not going to do that. We're going a different way. We're scrapping it all together or, you know, these kind of things. Yeah, I think it's very easy to assume that passion is a big part of design, but design is is more of a science than an art. It's problem solving, essentially. Um, and I think to be a good designer, you have to get over yourself pretty quickly. That's cool, um, yeah. That's... And I remember when I, going back to when I was in university in the first year when I was doing the 3D stuff, and I spent weeks and weeks on this 3D model and when it came towards the end of the project I realised that I'd got completely wrong end of the stick so I, I'd messed up you had up to the, meet up the, prob- the problem that they wanted you to solve yeah and I like. ended up just deleting the whole thing and I'd spent all this time on it and I think that was a really valuable lesson for me not to get too precious about what you've made and if something doesn't work throw it away that's part and the weight of time isn't a reason for keeping it yeah like, it's, you know, it's, that's, it's that's the it. gambler's fallacy right? that's like, it, yeah. I've invested so much into this yeah. thing I have to stick with it and that's not true and your failure is a part of the process and I, that's just something you have to live with and you you can't grow too attached to these things because what you're doing is solving a problem and ultimately if the thing you've made doesn't solve the problem it's bad design and it's not self-expression as much as some people might want to think it is or people assume it is uh, you know, there's a job to be done. So, and do you do you think that that's in all design, like you know, yeah, kind of absolutely. as a thing? Yeah, yeah. It, not just the way it's everything is really there is a problem you're trying to solve, and you're trying to get the best product that you can out there for you know, a solution out there to solve that. Yeah, and, and that's not to say it's completely devoid of mm. self-expression. You're always going to find a way to imprint part of yourself into mm. what you're making, but ultimately, you've, you've got to solve. The that's really there. yeah, that's cool, and then like. As, as going back, you know, to web then. So you're a web designer, web developer, and the medium of the web. What is it about the web that you love and you still do to this day? I mean, obviously it's your job. So, you know, I mean, you're doing it because you get paid as well. But what is it about the web that you love so much? And I think you've mentioned it already. It's A, that you can change something and see an effect immediately. Yep. And that, that effect be visible to potentially the entire world. Um, and that's incredibly satisfying. It's a lot of power, isn't it? If it, if yeah. It, yeah it's a, I mean, maybe um, I mean, my personal site gets maybe like three hits a day or something. So. <laughs> but it'll be in the show notes, so we'll make sure the <laughs> <laughs> But like, yeah, changing stuff on my building, a lot of people see that. And you get a lot of feedback, good oh, feedback yeah. about things that are right or wrong. If you say like, oh, okay, maybe I didn't solve that problem right then. You know, I didn't design that right because it was, you know, not meeting what the client, you know, what the, the user... And you get that feedback because you've got the user base. Yeah, exactly. That and feedback. that's a big part of the feedback is, is measuring things. So having analytics as well, you know, Google Analytics, having those tools available to everyone free is incredible. Do you um, use that a lot then? Do you find that you use a lot of analytic, like kind of, like kind of scientific, you know, like numbers behind? Empirical data. Yeah, yeah, yeah data, like analytical yeah. and... Uh, more Because it's obviously designed again, you feel of it as more of a, oh no, it's a feeling I have. Whereas... You're saying design, it isn't, it is, there is, it's both, of that. It's, it's, both, it's yeah. both, yeah. I mean, there was that big backlash at Google for finding the optimum shade of green or whatever it was <laughs> for their, their, uh, their buttons, and I think that freaks a lot of people out, but yeah, it's, you've got to take it. So what was that? I, I don't, I don't know they actually, so what was it? So they, they were just, uh, I think the manager or the product manager had one idea of blue and the designer had another idea and they actually just, combined the two shades and then they tested all three and then yeah I'd, A-B I'd, testing gone crazy yeah that's yeah I think you you have to have give some control to the designer because you you want to maintain at least some semblance of brand consistency yeah. and that's important too so I think if you look at the data side too much then you're going to lose sight of the bigger picture and maybe you're going to have the site be incredibly performant doing that very one thing but maybe the rest of it's going to fall apart and, and so as a developer, like obviously my kind of art in my mind is the code and like, you know, how you structure it, how it write, how it is, you know, the different types of languages, things like that, different paradigms. And what, what do you, do you find like beauty in code as you do design? Like, can you see good code and be like, I love that. Like I really, does it kind of, cause I know you mix the two worlds, you know, you're a designer and then 
you're seeing the front end and then you're seeing the back end and it's... I suppose it's probably harder to find good examples of that in markup in CSS. I mean, I've never been the strongest JavaScript developer, so um, yeah, I I think it would be wasted on me. Beautiful code. Uh, so so you, you <laughs> use it more as a tool. It's more of a tool to get the job at done that is the front end, you know, as opposed to look at this awesome CSS I wrote and how beautifully... I mean, because this is the thing that like, with Capri... Because, I mean... The front end is becoming more technical within like the state of like HTML, um, and but then mainly CSS, you know, becoming like CSS3, and then you've got like the pre processes and things like that, um, splitting it up. And like, I know that you've been speaking a lot about BEM. I don't know if you'd like care to like just kind of just like a brief little thing about BEM and like, sure, you- yeah. Um, I mean, sometimes it can be a little confusing because it feels very subjective, but uh, BEM stands for block element modifier. And the idea is that it's a naming convention for HTML elements. So if you have a widget, that would essentially be your block. So uh, let's say it's like a profile, then the block would be profile. And then you have elements within that profile. So say you've got an avatar. And then you can have modifiers. So you could have like editing the avatar or something like that. And the way it works is the first part of the class name will be uh, the block. Then you do a double underscore to indicate next, the element. And then you do a double hyphen for modifiers. Uh, so the reason why you use double is so that you can actually have hyphens and underscores yes. in, in, the, uh, in the block or the element or whatever. Um, and the advantage of doing this is it becomes very clear just from looking at the CSS what the structure of the markup will be, which is quite handy. Because it, some name, I mean, typically the naming is very much a single level, isn't it? You know, mm. it's just, I mean, you can't work out any structure within looking at, as you say, a selector element. Where is this actually positioned? What is the intent of this? Exactly, and, yeah. Um, so that's quite nice. And do, do you enjoy doing that type of stuff? Like, do you enjoy that, like looking into BEM and looking into these different ways of structuring code and things? Or, or is it more like a tool, you know, to like, this is helping aid? kind of managing this, the, the actual CSS as opposed to I really enjoy looking into these things. Because I do feel a lot of work's gone into the front end stuff because it's getting more complex, you know, with these pre-processes, everyone thinks it's very cool and all this. Yeah. No, I definitely derive satisfaction from both. Um, I think wherever you can improve your own processes, that's always a good thing. Um, I do like playing around with things like Gulp and every time I can find like a way to improve a process, that's really nice. Um, I was using Jekyll for a while. Oh, I still am. Um, and I found that sometimes uh, Jekyll Watch was a little bit slow. So I basically just rebuilt the whole thing in Node, in JavaScript, and then um, run a bash command from Gulp to build the Jekyll. That's cool. And it was just way faster. And just when you do stuff like that, it's really satisfying. And, and then it you see it, and like, then <laughs> <laughs> you're like, oh, I cry now. Yeah, Jekyll 3. Oh, man, Jekyll 3. That's going to be interesting. Yeah, oh, I haven't oh. looked into it too much, but I, I really like those sort of static site generators. Um, I have my own uh, virtual private server, and I used to have a ton of WordPress sites on there, and now I'm just systematically rooting them all out That's and replacing it. them because there's you know there's less exploits and exactly and there's because I suppose you know if you say all these I mean I don't know if you if they're your own personal or that you know people's but you know like the security updates you have to keep doing and you have to make them up to date and I mean it's static they are static what is what really has what features do Nothing you really need possibly go wrong <laughs> But, you know, I mean, that's interesting because you obviously then do get enjoyment from the programming side as well. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, and, and and then I suppose where do you, because with both ends, because you both happen to look into like the CSS stuff and the more code stuff, like JavaScript stuff and then design, what, what, where do you look for kind of inspiration and kind of really, where, where do you find like the latest things and latest trends and stuff like, because trends are in everything, I'm guessing. I'm assuming there's trends in design sure, as there yeah. are trends in, Absolutely. you know, programming. Um, so looking at, Friends and other practitioners that I like looking at their websites. And do you always get that feeling, oh, they're too much, that's so much better than me? It's that instant, like, you know, or do, do, are you able to kind of... Yeah, I mean, the... yeah, dribble is, is great for making <laughs> you feel terrible. I was thinking, yeah. But, uh, it's like that in anything. Like, how can you, looking through code, like, get up repos, and you're just like, yeah, no, this is making me feel really, really down. Well, in the last couple of months, I've been trying to use dribble and design and news and stuff as little as possible. 
because I was. Yeah, how's terrible. that going? Actually, it was. Yeah, yeah it's it's interesting. I know my, my thinking about it has changed quite a bit. But initially, I was terrified that everything was becoming homogenized, and that I was designing for the wrong audience. I was designing for my peers rather than for my actual audience. Uh, and that freaked me out. Kind of like a competition yeah. thing where you're like just trying to, yeah, it's for the per like, Yeah, and yeah. keep up with the trends. That's it. And I think that's not necessarily going to, as I say, design is, is solving a problem. Um, and I was letting it be a little bit too seductive, maybe. Um, I think in hindsight, maybe I as well. Was... I, I thought you need to, it's like that with code as well. Like you need that kind of experimentation, firstly, to keep you your fire burning inside, to keep yourself like really intrigued by it. Mm. As well as, you know, because to innovate, you know, like these things that you do do that may be, or oh, they may work, they may not, they may be a little bit out there, a bit crazy, mm. but they may work and they may be the next thing that you need. You well, know. I think I've, I've done as much of that since I have cut it out. Mm. And I think the conclusion that I've come to was that maybe I was overreacting a little bit too much. I think it's fine. <laughs> but I think I have done good work as a result of not overexposing myself to other influences. And what I've tried to do is take influences from other things. Um, and part of what made me change my thinking was that I went to um, the Ray and Charles Ames exhibit at the Barbican, and they had loads of great quotes. I can't remember what the quote is exactly, so I'm going to butcher it somewhat, but um, they were just saying that it's essentially the standing on the shoulder of giants yeah. principle, and that originality is not the pursuit. The pursuit is solving the job. So it was kind of what I was thinking before was like, I've got to solve the problem. Um, but then at the same back before I went to this exhibit, I thought that original originality was a virtue. And then going to that exhibit made me realize that I was wrong in both cases. <laughs> <laughs> that There's nothing wrong with building on the work of others. Um, and I'd also read about this recently in a book by um, Frank Camero who's a really, really interesting designer who does some great talks and writes some great books. And he was talking about, I think it's called Renga, which is this Japanese poetry where you would write a passage and then you would pass it on to someone else and they would extend it in this idea that you're building on other people's work to make something greater than... Than, than oneself, that's it, absolutely. It. Yeah, so I think I've got to take that, the whole dribble thing with a pinch of salt. And I do look at it a little bit, not nearly as much as I used to. It used to be like, a every, daily thing. Every time, yeah. you know, I had a lull in, in my day, I would go and, uh, and check it out. Um, whereas so how now do you, it's how do you like use it? How, how do you use it for inspiration? Do you kind of look at it and then it will come into your mind when you're looking at another problem? Oh, that is a quite cool. Or do you literally think I need to look? How can I use something like that in some work I'm doing now? Like, how do you? I think before, because I was seeing it all the time, it was just sort of passively going in. Yeah. Uh, and. And that was affecting everything I was doing, probably, to some degree. Whereas now, if I feel like I'm stuck on a problem, let's say it's a certain kind of, of interface or widget or whatever, I'll just look for like, oh, you know, credit card input or this, that, the other, and have a look through there. But um, I try not to be too dependent on it now. And I think my work's better for it. Well, that's good because it's just showing the confidence in yourself as well. To work I think that's out definitely the part of it. Yeah. I think it's, it's such a great tool for young designers as well, I think that just trying to emulate others is a great way to learn. Um, and I know they've been criticized a lot for, oh, it's just a four by 300 pixel thing or whatever, but they've added loads of great tools now. You can attach uh, attachments and things, and they've got a portfolio tool. So I think there's definitely value there. So I don't want to criticize it too much. And uh, It's here. how you use it. I think you say, <clears throat> you say, it's like Twitter, it's like any of these mediums. It's how you use it in your, you know, how it benefits you. You can take that bit, you know, as a lens, kind of work on it. This is how I use this product. Mm -hmm. It benefits me in that way, as opposed to maybe, in, in, you know, in the past, it may have detrimented you, but you may have felt, okay, this is, um, it's overtaken me in certain areas. It's, it's not the pro, it's not necessarily the site, the product itself that's causing the problem. It's how you're using it that is the problem. Yeah, exactly. Um, but beyond that, I think just, as you say, Twitter, uh, following designers that you know, uh, do, do you have like, I mean, stuff. is there good lists of design? Cause, I mean, coming from like the d development world, like I'm sure it's the same where, you know, if you start new, I mean, I remember when I was new, like kind of you find certain names and stuff and you're able to kind of, it's like a spider web where you're able to go from that person to other people. Is there, are there good people, like really kind of public people to sit be uh, like kind of follow? And yeah, look absolutely. Into? And I, I find that those designers usually have sort of circles around yeah. them of, of similar practitioners. 
Um, I found a lot of them through doing conferences when I was younger. Um, there used to be one called uh, New Adventures in Web Design that was really good. Uh, and then um, I started going to a conference in America called Brooklyn Beta, and I went three years, I think. Um, and there were loads of loads of great designers there, uh, and that was a great way to find out about interesting people and meet interesting people. I think that's probably the, the best way to find good designers is to meet them. That, uh, well, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm sure you've heard that. Like, it's always the thing, though, is that being in the computing world, we're not exactly the most social. Like, you know, getting out there and kind of... It's a scary, for me, it's a scary thing anyway to go to like to these conferences and just start speaking to people when you're always feeling like, oh, they know too much more than me and all this stuff and stuff. But I'm sure it's the same, similar thing in design where you're like, oh my God, that person's so famous in quotes in my world, you know. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm really terrible at approaching people at conferences, but I think the good thing about this one was that I was friends with a lot of people who were organizing the conference. Um, that holds a lot so, of weight. That's great. Yeah, you yeah. Kind of I getting mean, through these doors of like you know you can kind of get into the conversations. Yeah, with them. they were hanging out with all the speakers. You know, after the conference, I mean, this was like a three day thing. So um, you know, we'd go to Prospect Park like the day after the conference, and I would just be sitting in the park drinking beers with like the the people who were yeah. speaking, which was just really surreal, especially when I was younger. Um, but yeah, that was a great opportunity. So did you feel that then conferences and things like that are more valuable, like when you get into the workspace to kind of go into and stuff as, you know, as opposed to like maybe when university and things like, well, would you say going to conferences and stuff is more beneficial than going to university or like have this formal education? I think I suppose, just different. Yeah. I mean, you can do both. Um, I don't know about university now because it's so much more expensive than when I was there. So it's slightly terrifying. Um, I don't really think it had much bearing on, on my employment, but I can't say for certainty because I don't know what people were thinking when they were looking at my CV or whatever. So, um, but conferences are great when you're starting out. Um, I think I got a little bit jaded with them as I got older and, as you say, more confident in my own work. Um, I just remember going to a conference and just feeling like everything they were talking about was two years out of date. Yeah. Um, and I think that does happen quite a lot. But... As a younger designer and to anyone who wants to get into design, I think conferences are a really great way, a good great step. way just to get you fired up. You know, after a conference, you just feel like you want to go out and take on the world and, and do loads of cool stuff. So there's value in that alone, let alone the networking and, and finding out about new uh, practitioners. And and then, like, kind of what other areas then, like, in design, you've got the web design. Like, is there any other areas of design that interest you at this present date? Like, do you still keep in, you know, like, I know you say you move the wet, you know, wedding stuff. You kind of was able to experiment a bit there with different mediums. Are there any ones that you kind of look at on a daily basis and kind of keep an eye on? Um, I suppose so. I mean, like I said, I went to the, the Ames exhibit. Yeah. Um, and I've been to a few other uh, design talks. Um I'm trying to remember the name of the guy now. He he did that BBC series where he was like a French designer and you had to like design a product and then it was like a reality TV show, but it was like... It's kind of like the Apprentice style thing, is it then? or oh, Something Stark. I can't remember. It's not John Stark. It's definitely not John Stark. And it's not Tony Stark. Either. <laughs> <laughs> um, but where I can, yeah. Um, and obviously like all the sort of the old classics like um, Saul Bass... There's an incredible video on on YouTube, and it's his pitch to Bell Systems, and he's uh, pitching a brand, and he goes into so much detail about the logo and the supporting colors and patterns, uh, and all of this feeds into your work. And when you're developing a brand, it's just really essential that you you do think about things beyond the logo yeah. and the typeface. Uh, how it's going to be used, how the whole idea, how the whole kind of thing is going to be taken. Exactly. Like a logo is going to be used in more than just the top left section of a website or whatever. Uh, and I think these sort of outside influences really affect that and make you think about other applications of design. And Do you like those challenges? I can, I can say, yeah, yeah, those yeah, are the yeah, ones. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to do more of it in my builder. We, I think we just do stuff like T-shirts. I did some... Um, when you did Symphony Live and we had those big banners well, and the t-shirt you're wearing right, t-shirt now. right now exactly yeah. that was um, a... and yeah as I say doing the wedding invites and stuff it's nice to sort of get outside of web design every now and then so. and then so with web design um, like do you have a process 
Like, is there a process to how you design Ab- things? Absolutely, yeah. Um, and that's only become more apparent. Um, and is it something you've taken from other people, or is it something you've kind of thought up yourself? Like, you've, you know, like, has it been something you would talk to, to some do? Extent, or? I, I think some of the best conferences or the best conference talks are, that I've seen are about process. Yeah. People will show you exactly how they work. Um, and as I was saying before, sketch is a real essential part of my process. Um, and artboards have just changed the game for me. Because before, is that a sketch, a sketch thing? Artboards. Yeah. Thing? So it's, the idea is that you have a single document, and then you all have lots of artboards or like sort of workspaces. Yes. So like, I mean, we're looking at Google Docs now. It'd be like if you could see multiple pages within the same space. And before, when I was working in Photoshop and I'd have a design, I would save it and then clone it essentially, and then work on that again. Whereas with art, artboards, it's just sort of grabbing that whole canvas and just dragging it over and making another version. And now my work looks more like a timeline or a film strip. Yep. And you have loads of copies of essentially the same thing with the variations on a theme. And every time I come to a point where there's a decision to be made, where it's like, oh, do I move this like to the left or slightly down? Or is this going to be blue or green? Uh, both options are explored because you just clone the artboard. It's like a, t- I say a timeline of being able to see this story. And you're then able, as you say, like being able to easily see the process of like, okay, where, which area do you like from and things like that. Mm. Like, and, and this is also essential because you have a, of a, a history essentially of all of your design decisions, decisions, and you can see, you can roll back, you can get, yeah, doing. that's it. Uh, yeah, you can just branch off somewhere else. You can find actually and, this bit was better and I should have gone that way and using this bit and. Yeah. And it really just helps you explore options. I mean, especially early on. Um, and uh, like my builder, we've got quite an established design language. Yeah. That's, it's been built up over years, but the nice thing about that is, is that it's almost got to the point where I don't even need wireframes because I know what most of the common elements are and I can just branch off and use those and they're all um, like symbols and templates yeah. within Sketch as well. So you can work very quickly and have a finished comp at the end, which is, is really nice. And like I was saying before, a lot of design is managing other people's expectations. So as well as a guide for me showing me where I've come from and where I'm going, when I want to show someone my design and get it signed off and get people on board, I start them at the beginning and I just work through it. Show them the whole story. And you give them the whole story. And it's like the, it's like a git history, isn't it? Of like this is how the process came through for each commit of the story of how we got to where we are. Yeah, uh, and even if I'm just showing them the finished thing, they'll be like, "Oh, or well, what if you move that there?" And then I can just go back through the timeline Easily and say, go. "I already did that, and it doesn't work because of this reason, and this reason, and this reason." That's great. And then you can show the development from that point that they were at, and show them how you got to where you are. Exactly. So it's it's such an invaluable tool, not only for my own development. Um, developing designs, but also communicating those decisions to other people. And, and do you think the reason? Because I mean, I suppose because when you first started, you weren't really using like Photoshop or sk- uh, sketches and things. Like, well, what 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 really made you say that's now now an invaluable tool? Is it because of doing the, almost like having to get it signed off and getting client work and having to do these multiple decisions? Like, you can't exactly do these timeline trees of things. You know, like coding these, you'd have to. You know, it'd be a lot more work. Is that the reason why that you? Yeah, you just you don't get nearly the level of development you don't explore all the possible avenues you you end up picking a road and going down it and hoping for the best yeah. and now it's just so much easier and it's so much of cheaper i guess now, to be able to like go oh, i can tweak that there and there and it's now that's just another comp for it you know i can see as opposed to as you say like you're signing up this is it now mm. then this is it and then this is it well, yeah it's like having all the roads ahead of you and you can see which ones are going to be promising and then so it's having that foresight to try all the different avenues and do you think that's because of like maturing now like as a designer as opposed to because you're saying like you, you instant feedback instant gratification was when the beginning you know whereas like oh you know the, the reason why you like the web and designing for the web in css was that you could just e- easily see these kind of things but mm. you do need this kind of story yeah, you definitely get more patient as you get older and i think also willing to let go of ideas that aren't working like i was saying before um, you are less afraid of, of doing a great body of work and then not bearing not any fruit. Um, and I've been looking back recently at all the work I've done at my builder and it's just this huge, huge folder. I mean, it's like 50% PSDs and 50% sketch files because I've switched halfway through. And the amount of stuff that doesn't make it to the site is staggering, but you know that 
all the work that is live is better yeah having done it there was a reason why it's on there like you know it, all the work and, and it's almost like it is an accumulation that you had to go through this process to get to the final output yeah. like it wasn't the fact that there was another road you could have gone down you had to explore this yes exactly you know you, yeah, there was a reason for it and I suppose that then brings up the Photoshop versus sketch debate and you, you, you kind of mentioned that you know that these boards what was it again the art time boards. art boards are kind yeah. of a massive uh, win on it and what other things to do with the Photoshop well, I think sketch Photoshop actually has art boards now I think oh wow there's a bit of a features arms race between the two um, but then isn't Photoshop just everything I, I, I'm very confused what when obviously they look at the, the name Photoshop and it's become this symbol of just every, like the the software package isn't exactly specific to one problem, is it? It's kind of sure, a... I, and I think that's part of its downfall, yeah. really. I think was why people are moving to Sketch. Um, I mean, Photoshop is always going to be huge because it is intended for editing photos, obviously, um, and obviously it's been used by web designers a whole lot. But as the profession has grown and matured, it needs its own tools. And that's exactly what Sketch has done, and I think that's the reason for its success. And it's only a, a Sketch is a Mac only product, isn't it? I believe so. Yeah, yeah. Bohemian coding. Yeah, I think it's just Mac. But um, they've done a cracking job of just putting in all the features that you want. Fantastic export tools. They're not paying me anything. I swear to God. Um, yeah, it's just really solid. There's no bloat. I think that's part of the reason people moved away from it is because well, because it's Photoshop solving that one problem, isn't it? It's exactly. That, yeah, that it's, is it's the problem. It's much more These are the problems I have. This but, is the solve. Yeah, the problem it solves it solves very well. Whereas Photoshop, there's loads of other stuff bundled in. And the other downfall, I think, for Photoshop, at least for for web designers, is the pricing, the creative crowd, cloud model. If you're not in an agency or a company that has tons of cash that could just throw can a give you a cloud yeah. subscription, then the one-off payment for Sketch is a much more attractive proposition. And for me, I was a fairly earlier adopter, so I think it was something like $50, where now it's $100. And I think they can get away with charging that because it's, uh, you know, it's worth it. It does everything. And does it do everything you need then? Like, you aren't going to need to go into, say, like Photoshop. Only very it? occasionally. Because you do vector work do... and things like that. You can do... Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's, it's a vector tool. But sometimes I will need to do some photo manipulation stuff. There's very, That's the only thing, yeah, the very thing. basic photo manipulation stuff in Sketch. In fact, I find that I can get better photo editing in uh, VSCO cam for iPhone or even, <laughs> in, even Instagram. The photo editing tools are substantially better than Sketch. So sometimes I will actually edit stuff on my phone. Just so you can and then email really it to myself. <laughs> um, but there are other tools, I think, um, that the Affinity guys are doing some really great tools. You've got Affinity Designer and Affinity Photo, and I think that's going to replace your photo editing stuff. And, and do you feel then that Photoshop, I mean, it's always going to be around, but do you feel now there's a lot more competition oh, for, yeah. for something else? Absolutely. Because I know that Adobe were trying, they've been trying their best to kind of even make Photoshop that or something else, the web-centric thing. Yeah, I mean, they've had all sorts of other little uh, projects and experiments like Edge or whatever, and these ways of... I mean, I think they're catering to sort of the more ad side of the creative market and replacing Flash banners with with HTML5 banners, and I think they're doing a great job. They must have hated when, that. like, Flash is just dead now, because obviously they bought Macromedia thinking that this is this big oh, yeah, hotbed of... You know, I'm sure they've found... <clears throat> ways to sort of pivot that into something useful uh, and I think helping there obviously there are tons of people who are really invested in that platform and they've done a good job of moving those people over to to these other things I think there's edge and there was something else yeah I, that's a, that's one that brings a bell and there was there was another one but I can't remember off the top of my head that they've been really trying their best to you yeah, but the people just end up with Photoshop again like they will just go back to Photoshop as this thing and I mean you just say like they've got timelines now and things like that so they're taking artboards yeah, yeah artboards as it so well, you keep thinking timelines that's what visually <laughs> what they look like but you know like so they're taking these ideas I mean is sketch kind of reciprocating that where I mean obviously they must have Borrowed and stolen a couple of good ideas. Oh yeah, of course. Had, but yeah. Just, I mean, is there a back and forth now where maybe there could be? I mean, I just haven't been keeping up with Photoshop. I haven't felt the need to switch back. Um, you know, I've got my copy of Sketch now. It is just a one-off payment. Um, and, and is that like I'm, I'm fully invested payment. in? Is that like version? Because I know it's version three, isn't it? They're on the three releases, so I'm yeah. sure maybe after version four, maybe you have to pay again. I don't know. Maybe how about I, I don't know. But, but also, I, I mean, I used good. to know all of the Photoshop shortcuts and everything. I've forgotten them all now. 
So I that muscle memory is gone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I can't imagine a situation where I'll move back. Maybe I'll move on to yet another tool. But for now, it, it does everything I want it to. So. And then, because I mean, one of the things I remember you showing me because when you loaned up the sketch doc uh, file, it was the export for the Retina display stuff. I like, export this in, you know, times that and all these, and that really sort that was an amazing. Export. Yeah. So where you've got a group of layers, or you can create something called a slice, where you basically just say, "I want to export anything that is within this area," because uh, it is all vectors. You can say export it at times, you know, zero point five times two times three, and when you're doing. Uh, particularly for native apps where you need export to export assets as, as all these different sizes for different screen resolutions you can just do that super easy and then super the SVG quick, yeah. stuff as well I'm sure you know exporting those with- yeah the SVG stuff's a little flaky um, the my builder homepage that we did last summer that uses all SVG assets and none of them none of the ones that I exported from sketch worked in Firefox so what oh, I actually really? ended wow. up doing was creating the assets in sketch copying them pasting them into Affinity Designer, exporting them from there, and then from there they would work. Was there a reason? Was it just a technical... I think Sketch add a load of metadata to make importing... um, Bringing them back in to them, yeah, after the fact. Yeah, and I think Firefox didn't like it. So maybe they fix that now. I don't know. I haven't exported any SVG assets in a while. Um, But Affinity did it just fine. I think Affinity is like £40 now. Uh, so it's not too bad. So these tools have really it. replaced, you say, replaced Photoshop for you. For me, um, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, with that then, because like, so you've got your designing and everything, like the testing on browsers, because you don't really get that with it. Well, I mean, a print medium, maybe you do, like, you know, obviously you need to make sure it's printed at a certain, you know, but the amount of browsers and the pressure. I'll tell you one thing. When I was doing these wedding invites, I printed the main invite uh, printers in London Fields. And I did some other includes because I wanted to have this whole sort of package feel with lots of bits and pieces in there uh, at the office printer. And all the color that was, well, all of the gray on the design on the professionally printed stuff came out warm and all the stuff so was slightly red. Uh, and all the stuff on the office printer came out slightly blue. So I think you have to do testing with print. Wow, well. there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's total minefield. Um, but with regards to web, when I was doing agency work, we had tons of clients who it had to work in IE6. I don't want to work in IE6 yet. It needs to work in IE6. Well, we had a, we had a client where um, they were making a product that was only going to be used by large companies that would use IE6. Yeah, it's pretty much that. It's just a code for IE6, isn't it? They're yeah, like and it was a total nightmare. Um, but I think because I did it for such a long time, you know, I got to know these beasts and I knew how to... I became like the IE6 whisperer. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I can it, feel... It, it gets to the things. point where you know which bits are going to go weird That's and you can preempt it. And it actually wasn't that bad. But now it's not even an issue because Internet Explorer have drops... Microsoft have dropped support for almost all of the internet Apart even, from 10. 11, even 10, 11 yeah. is the only one isn't it I think, and and that's the, I think the oldest the... thanks to Facebook and Google saying well we're not going to support it either people just aren't using those browsers anymore and the cross browser really is right, for IE at least has become a thing of the past I think the thing I have gripes with these days is Android stock browser which is arguably even worse I know you, you do have to kind of think that, don't you? It's just like rolling around. The yeah, because it it's this around. thing that I don't understand. You know, I got to, I spent ages at an agency, as I say, getting to understand. The the, yeah, IE. exactly. And now with Stock Browser, it's a new problem, <laughs> and I don't do half as much front end development as I used to because I'm mostly doing design work now. So when I do come across problems in in Android Stock Browser, it is a real headache. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you, stock and I, I will plus one on that because yeah. it is the devil. It is ridiculous. And, and obviously so much testing... more fiddly because you have touch events. That's There's this all exactly, this whole yeah. extra set of features, this whole extra suite of things that can go wrong. All the, yeah, extra problems that it's caused because of the lovely yeah, stock browser. It's a real it is the devil. And it's just so weird because it's, you know, it's Android, it's Google. It's been and like, bit, Chrome no, this is, is the best. This is what I love. They have uh, Chrome, you know, and this yeah. is it. And they had to have this other browser. I mean, they still have the stock browser, and I think that's because of the whole probably competitive, you know, they can't provide their own browser with it. They have to have a generic Android browser. 
Yeah. Um, and I think that's the Android brand. But it's WebKit based. It should be good. Yeah. No, no, no. There's always these little things and debugging it's a ball eight. And I mean, like, cause with then, so you say you've got, you're very good at kind of understanding and feeling these browsers essentially because. Well, I was. I've, I've forgotten it all now because it's been no <laughs> yeah, I haven't had to do any IE6 stuff in years. So, but. But yeah, what, what did, do you, I mean, do you feel, and, and I suppose this is kind of, you know, like when you're in a sketch file, um, you've kind of got free reign. Mm. Until you get to the browser, and then you're going to have these problems, and you've got these constraints in your head of like, oh, well, that browser's not going to deal with that well, and that, you know, this is not going to work there, and things like that. And and how do you kind of work with that? Like the free reign of something like Sketch. Well, I have a very of- very sort of st- strong understanding of what will work and what won't work. And you're reason. constantly in your design phase, going with that. In your yeah, mind. I mean, you can't help but. And, and I think a lot of people would say that is. Uh, quite limiting and restrictive. Um, I do try and push myself outside of those boundaries every now and then. Because you, you know the code the as well. And I think that's it. And I think because you know the code as well. Because what I'm thinking is like, a des- I remember that, you know, in design agency kind of settings where you would have someone who works in Photoshop um, or, you know, a sketch or package like that, and then they would give it to the developer who'd say, code this and you'll you'll go down a load of dead ends, you know, where the developer will say, oh, we can't do well, that. Well, this is it, you know, and, and then there's, you know, I mean, the, the you know, you're, you're then essentially, you know, trying to push, I mean, you push the developer to do new things, good things and things like that, because you don't know what's possible or you know kind of what's possible because you, it's possible in Photoshop or it's possible in Sketch. Mm. It's essentially not possible. I was wondering, does that kind of, do you feel that you kind of maybe it's a restrict, you do restrict yourself maybe a lot then in design phase or do you can, you can give yourself that kind of feeling of, no, I'm going to be a bit more free. And then, because you think, oh, I don't know how to do that implementation wise. Did you ever kind of think, that's okay. I'm sure we can work it out, you know? Yeah, it's a balance. I mean, with the, the stuff we've been doing at my builder recently, I've been trying to work, um, sticky buttons mm, into a lot of mobile stuff. Yes. And that's caused a lot of headaches. And I totally get why a lot of companies have, have gone, you know, LinkedIn, they tried to do web and it didn't work out and ended up going native yep. and like that. It is hard to make that sort of really nice slick interface on the web. Um, I mean, we've managed to work around it in ways, but the the Android stock browser support of like fixed positioning and stuff is just drastically different to, to iOS. The way that the virtual keyboard works in iOS is, is vastly different to Android. So it can be really hard to work around. Why do we always shoot ourselves in the foot? I, I, I feel we always do. It's like, <laughs> you can see like the story of I you, you and me or just developers. Oh yeah. Well, we all, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. Us, you know, is it, you know, kind of, but you know, it's, you think of IE6 and IE6 obviously, you know, really was it won, IE won. So they're like, well, you know, we don't have to do, we can do whatever we want really. Whereas now we've learned, should we learn from the mistakes of IE, you know, and stuff as obviously we don't because. Well, yeah. I mean, arguably it's much worse now before you had, you know, several versions of IE6. Whereas now there's what, like 20,000 yeah. different screen device yeah. sizes and, combinations and obviously of... different hardware, different everything, you know, and Android. Yeah. And... I mean, device fragmentation has never been more of a problem than it has now. But um, I mean, going back to that problem, the, the, the question yeah. you asked about being able to code, uh, a friend of mine um, started working for a, for a, for a company and he had he was just working as a designer. He wasn't actually doing any code, but he had a coding background, much like myself. Uh, and he would take his designs to the product uh, to the developers, and they would work on it. And they would say, "Oh, we can't do this. And this isn't possible." And then he would say, "Well, actually, it is. And this is how you do it." So it goes both ways, you know. I think a lot of the time, <laughs> the developers, perhaps if they're not that into markup, and I know a lot of developers aren't, um, that you can do stuff. The developers otherwise wouldn't I think that's also. it and I think that's having a good kind of team and a, you know I, I want to feel that you know if it's a developer you want to try you know like if it's possible you know if you've got the time and the you know the ability to, to be able to learn and or you know do something like that you want to be able to do the design that that person's laid out and I think I know that you know I, I can feel for a designer who doesn't know the code implementation wise because essentially what's happening is it's going through proxy isn't it because the design's happening you're going through this proxy that's the developer who probably hasn't got a designer mind or cares really too much about the design mm-hmm. as opposed to the code. And then it eventually comes out. Whereas you've kind of you know, obviously got, you know, you can go straight to what you want. Yeah. I which think is a massive sell and a massive bonus for you. If you can't develop yourself, you have to have a great deal of trust in the developer that you're working with. And there's a lot of really good developers out there who care about this sort of stuff. 
and they want to get the details right and they and they want to make it work um but there's a lot you don't and if you're a designer who can't code that can be really frustrating because you don't get that level of polish and you never sometimes you never will and when i was freelance for a while uh in 2012 2013 i was freelance for five months um i was mostly doing front-end work um i was helping a lot of people make their designs work responsibly and i worked for uh, a creative agency and none of them really had any um development background and i had the design background i had the development background and it was really nice to work with a designer who really appreciated that i wanted their vision he, he, they felt you know the care of these individual bits and things like exactly. that exactly and for me as a developer that was really satisfying helping that actual vision because you, they, you knew that they, yeah, that's it. Because they can't do it, you can actually give it to yeah, them. Yeah, and they they really appreciate that, and I think that made us both care a lot more about what was happening because we both had that mutual respect for what we were doing. And I suppose then that uh, does bring up the question of: Do you think you can be a web designer but not code? Yes, yeah, I think so. Um, I think there's other areas that you can focus on and you can get good at. Uh, personally, I wouldn't like to do it that way, but I totally understand people that do. I don't have a problem with people who who don't want to do that. I think just developing that sort of most basic semblance of understanding can go a really long way. Do you think it's, it's good to know like, what's position. possible? Kind of like, even if you don't need to know how it's possible, but like understanding the limitations of the platform. Or yeah, understanding and, and, that... and more so than that, just having respect for what the other person does is massive. And I think if you don't have that... Uh, empathy towards the other side of that. Yeah, because how are they going to fit it to you? Exactly, that's it. You can't, you know, exactly. Yeah, and I've worked with developers who who don't necessarily have much respect for design, and that can be really frustrating, and you're going to run into problems if you don't have respect for each other. So I think even if you you just learn enough to know the problems that the other person is going to have... That's going to help grease the wheels. and I think it works both ways. I mean, and, and I suppose that's, a, you know, I know that kind of, I, I think I've already asked you this before in the past, and it's just like, for someone, a developer like myself, what, what materials or people or kind of things would you think kind of point us in that direction? Like, what would you make us look into and kind of, you know, to get a feel for? Because I feel, you know, as developers, you know, I, I, as my, like me, I want to understand more what the problem is. You know, and like, you know, oh, it's just a pretty, you know, because you can tell it, you know, some people can say they can see a good design from a bad design and things like that. But then, as you said, there's a lot of thought and a lot of stat, you know, a lot of work has gone into that. It's not just yeah. it's a pretty picture. Um, I would say to any developer who, who feels like they don't have an understanding or, but wants to develop one is that I think design comes across as being incredibly subjective. And, and to some degree it is, and it's a matter of taste or what have you. But as I said before, it is problem solving. Um, there's method to it. It's not just, oh, that's a pretty color, that's a pretty shape. Uh, you're solving problems. There are very established patterns and ways of working and processes. Uh, and just being mindful of, of those constraints and those processes can go a long way towards helping you work with a designer. Um, I bought with me a book by Frank Camaro, who I mentioned earlier, that I'll lend to you and that I recommend Thank you very anyone much, uh, to read. There's a, it's called The Shape of Design, and you can read it online for free as well as an ebook. So, um, brilliant! I'll definitely, put, yeah, I'll definitely yeah. put that in the show notes. I think, I think that's, I think, and I say it works both ways. I feel you know where us developers are kind of thinking, well, you know, they should, you know, they need to understand how hard it is for us, but we need to understand how hard it is for design. And as you say, because people think it's so subjective and it's just oh, it's a pretty color and things like that, it's not. There's so much more to it. Yeah, like There's for so example, much. this this project so I've been working on this application at my builder, and uh, it's this is a, a list management essentially, and each item in the list goes through multiple phases, and each phase you're adding extra functionality in, and you need to have consistent wayfinding. People need to know where they are. You can't move something from one phase to another just because you need to add something else in. So you need to keep it familiar, but you also need to add in change as you're progressing through. You can't just add stuff in wherever you want because you're going to throw people off. So, I mean, there's so much to figure out and consider. And then on top of that, you know, you've got these five different phases for each item 
going through a uh, progression, but then that has to work in desktop, it has to work in mobile, you move one thing, you have to move everything else. Um, and I think it's very easy to look at someone else's design and say, oh, it's, it's easy, you just move that over there. And then you, you, you don't understand every what, combination this, that's exactly, falls yeah. apart. And you do need to have a deep understanding of of where everything needs to be and how it needs to work. And it is like a house of cards. You know, you take one card away, the whole thing falls down. So. And, and there's a reason behind every decision. Like there isn't, as you say, it hasn't just been, I'll just chuck it there. We put it there because we felt, you know, it was, there was a reason behind that, as you say, because of the story, because, you know, obviously this is where the best place people would find it. And exactly. And again, like I was saying before, when you're showing someone a design and they're like, oh, well, why didn't you make this button? blue and then you go back through the process and yeah. you show them show what happened if you that. if you do that and if you have that in your development work and someone says well, well just do it again you can show them and you can say like it doesn't work because you know as you progress through the phases it falls apart here and and it's very much on the burden of the designer to help that person understand yeah. why those things aren't possible i mean it's it's easy to point uh, uh, and say oh it's a developer's problem because they don't understand yeah. us but it's just as much the designer's responsibility to educate them and keep them in the loop and be able to communicate effectively provide them enough of the platform to say look i'm going to give you this exactly yeah you know we're saying with developer you know like why can't you do that mm. you know if i if it's, it's not it, i don't think it's a good enough answer to say no it's not possible to exactly. I mean, that's problem. it's incredibly frustrating, and, yeah. and that does go both ways. And if I talk to a developer and they're like, "Oh, we can't do it; it's impossible," that drives nothing, me mad. Yeah, because it nothing is impossible. Like nothing is impossible. You exactly. know, it's, but things are, are very difficult and yeah. be very time consuming and go over. And there's multiple factors. It's not the fact that it's not possible in code. It's the fact that maybe it's a business decision. It's not possible. Like, exactly. It, 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 not possible is not an answer mm. to me. It, it, there are so many. It, it's really just have enough respect for your colleague to explain to them why it's not yeah, possible. Absolutely. And then they're going to learn. And then the, the next problem that comes along, you won't, may not have, you know, they, they will already have that in their mind. Your, your designer, developer will already have it in their mind about why, you know, we've chosen that direction. Exactly. And it just goes back to what I was saying yeah. earlier is, you know, you don't necessarily need to code. You just need to understand the, the ins and outs of it. Yeah. You, to the extent that you can have respect for what your peers are doing. And I think as long as people have respect for each other and are able to communicate, then you're probably going to end up building something good. That's awesome. And, and actually, the last question I would like to um, bring up is, because you mentioned design um, agency work, mm-hmm. and now obviously you're working on a product yeah. instead. And uh, obviously there's a lot of difference there, but like, what do you, what's your personal opinion on both? Like, what do you prefer? What, what bits are you know, kind of you like from each? I mean, I, I'm really glad that I've done both. And I think agency work is a great way to start out. It's a good way to learn. It allows you to uh, dip kind it, of in different, like lots of different things. Yeah, and, exactly. I mean, most agencies are going to have a bunch of different clients. So you can try out lots of different things and lots of different kinds of problem solving. Uh, the problem is you're never going to get too deep into any one of those clients. Um, I mean, it, it can be upsetting because you have to learn to manage your time very effectively. And that's a good thing. But ultimately, everything that you do, someone has to be billed for it. And sometimes you're going to do work. You're, you're not going to do work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that, that time has to be attributed for. Um, and that can be tough. But yeah, it is great for for learning how to manage your time, uh, how to talk to clients. I mean, working for a product, I don't need to sell my ideas half as much as I did before. Um being able to estimate, and that's incredibly hard to do, being able to estimate for a project. Yeah, because of the money. It's like, how much is this going to cost me? Well, exactly. I need to estimate. Yeah, exactly. um, and it teaches you some really hard lessons in pragmatism. I see. Yeah, I how do you estimate you design and things like that? It's a, that must be, yeah, a bewildering thing. It's very thing. hard, yeah. And just, it's a learning. <laughs> it's a learning. That, yeah. yeah, I mean, when I was in an agency, I was, I was doing quite a bit more front-end development, but I was also doing a lot of application design. And it is hard, and... As I was saying, when I was younger, I was doing a lot more developing, uh, designing in the browser, and that certainly helped save time. Because you, yeah, you didn't have that step. Yeah, but it, I wasn't necessarily producing the best results. Um, but yeah, there's lots of valuable lessons to be learned from agency work, but also 
on the flip side, working for a product, you you get that depth of understanding that you're not likely to get from from an agency unless you've worked there for years and years and years. Because it's the brand, isn't it? I suppose, and like you you may dip your toe in with the brand or try and create a sure. brand for some design agency. But, but you, you you get the feedback when you're working on a product. That's I mean, that's such a huge part of it is is working closely with uh, you know in companies you'll have design researchers, and their whole job is to just find you salient bits of information and say users are looking for this or they're struggling here. And it's, and it's not short-lived. Like, you know, it's the same thing with code where you, you go on a project, you create something, you leave. This code or this design is going to be there for years maybe to come. Like, you're going to have to live with the decision. Or just made. three months and then it's gone. It's well, ethereal. There you, you go. Know? That's it. Which is, is arguably worse, that you spend months working on a thing and then it's gone. Um, but with product work, the, I guess the most valuable thing is you know if what you've designed has worked. Because when you're not getting that feedback, when you're not working on one thing for a sustained amount of time, you could have made a solution, but you don't know if it works. Yeah. Whereas on a product, you get that feedback yeah. and you say, you know, you've got this conversion or this uptake. And you learn and so you much more about the intricate you can details. It, yeah. And you can see those numbers go up or down. Uh, and that's really satisfying that you know that you've done your job. And so would you say then it's it's beneficial to do both in your career? Like, yes. I, I, yeah, definitely. Yeah, 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 I'll yeah. take it. I think both. there's, you know... And maybe do there's, there's does agency work first, then into a product. I mean, I, obviously you can't really sometimes I choose mean, maybe. that. Maybe. Um, before I did agency work, like I mentioned, I worked at um, videogamer.com, and that's a product. Um, but they both have their own advantages, and I don't think you're going to get the, all of those same lessons from any one of those yeah. kinds of... It's all you're going to learn throughout either, and either both of them have value in them. Yeah, so for designers starting out, I would say try and do some agency work, try and do some product work. Um, I mean, when I was doing agency work, we did product work, but not... To the everything. extent, this is exactly it, that's it. Yeah. Well, Will, thank you so much for taking yeah, the time you. out, man. It's been, it has been a great podcast, and we will speak to you next week. Goodbye. You've been listening to Three Devs and a Maybe. You can contact us at contact at 3devsandamaybe.com or follow us on Twitter at the number 3 devs and a maybe.